Thanks, Thanks a lot, Arindam. And uh, welcome to the third session of the day. The first speaker is Professor Jim Eisenstein from Caltech. Professor please. Forty-five minutes. Uh, we can <laughs> we can negotiate. We can negotiate. We can negotiate. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation to give a talk here. I'm delighted to be here. I appreciate it very much. I'm going to tell you today about the you can see the title yourself. That's mostly accurate, although I've added a bunch of stuff at the very end of the talk uh, concerning some uh, very new data, which I may or may not get to. I don't. We'll see how it goes. So the work that I'm going to tell you about was done well, actually, by a series of graduate students over quite a while now. But most of the stuff that I'll actually I'll focus on today was done by, is this not working now? The photons are gone. Steve, do you have some photons for me? Um, this is not working at the moment. Oh, it's kind of working, but look, the battery's kind of dead. Anyway, most of the work was done uh, that I'm going to tell you about today was done by Aaron Fink and Debelina Nandy. Debelina is actually from here, and she's a, a graduate student of mine. Uh, 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 currently, and she's carrying on these experiments. Uh, uh, Lauren Pfeiffer and Ken West, who you see the names there, they're the uh, fellows who grew the samples that we use for these experiments. And I like to say every time that and it's true that without them, uh, we wouldn't be able to do anything. Uh, so I, this is a talk uh, which will initially appear to be about the quantum Hall effect. And indeed, the quantum Hall effect is certainly involved. So let me start by showing you a very old picture of the quantized Hall effect, but not in uh, what you might think, uh, a two-dimensional electron gas, but in fact in a double-layer two-dimensional electron gas that is present inside uh, a header structure that looks like this. So it's a double quantum well, a couple of gallium arsenide quantum wells separated by a barrier layer. And we've been looking at this system for a long time, and suffice it to say that it shows lots of interesting quantized Hall states, the great majority of which are no different than the ones that you experience in a single-layer system. But some of them are different. And in particular, two that I've, I've, uh, I've highlighted here, one that I've labeled with one half, that's the filling of the Landa levels, half filled, and the other one uh, here I've labeled with one, which is filling factor one. Uh, those two plateaus are, in fact, not present in a single layer system. Now, you have to be just careful right at the outset that these filling factors are for the total electron density in the system, not the density in the individual layers. So when you think of filling factor one, it's not a one Landau, it's one, a totally one Landau level, but half of the electrons are in one quantum well, the other half are in the other quantum well. So uh, this piece of uh, number theory down here is correct, that one is equal to a half plus a half. So this is a situation in which if the layers were far apart from one another, there would not be a Hall plateau. So this is a special state. So is this one, but I'm not going to talk about that one today. So this filling factor one state uh, consists of two layers, which uh, if you ignore the interactions between them, are both at the half filling point. And we can study this extensively uh, as a function of different parameters. For example, the separation between the layers could be uh, the vertical axis here. The horizontal axis is the degree of tunneling uh, between the, uh, the two quantum wells, which is determined by how tall and how thick the barrier is. So you can make all kinds, or Lauren Pfeiffer can make all kinds of samples, some of which have strong tunneling, some of which have very weak tunneling. And you can map out where you see that quantized Hall affected filling factor one and where you do not. And in fact, what you see here, and this is a very important part of uh, what I want you to understand, is that uh, even if the tunneling uh, between the two layers, so if the barrier somehow fictitiously was made infinitely tall, even if that tunneling is made arbitrarily small, it's still true that if you go to layer separations, and it doesn't matter what the units of these are, but small enough layer separations, the blue dots give way to red dots. Red dots are those samples for which you do see the quantized Hall effect. So what I'm saying is that tunneling is very much important, but if you go in the limit of no tunneling, the physics I'm about to describe to you today still exists. This is important to understand. Um, Question? Yes? No quantum Hall effect. Since it is half, is something special like composite stability? Yeah, so you could, you could imagine, I mean, in the simplest way of thinking of things, all these blue dot samples consist of essentially two layers, each of which are in a composite fermion metallic state. It's compressible. There's no quantized Hall effect. But when they come close together, they do something different. And there's a green, you know, sort of a green line which separates the two different types of behavior. And the nature of that phase transition is not, not something I'm going to talk about today. It's very interesting. We've worked on, done a lot of experiments on the phase transition itself, but I'm not going to say much about it today. 
for the purposes of today's talk, you can more or less reduce this phase diagram to a one-dimensional line where the only important parameter is the spacing between the layers. All of the samples that I'm going to be using have an extremely small amount of tunneling in them. What does small mean? Small means in comparison to any other energy scale, important energy scale in the problem. The tunneling in particular, the tunnel splitting of the energy levels is maybe a million or 10 million times smaller than the Coulomb repulsion energy between electrons. So Coulomb interactions dominate by just orders of magnitude. Tunneling's not zero, you can never make it zero, but it's very, very small and unimportant to the stability of the state. Now, so what, what do you see in addition to the quantum Hall effect? So the quantum Hall effect for the red dots was present for the blue dots, it was not present. What else, what other physical things do you, do you find that separate uh, these two different states of matter? Well, uh, this is a map a picture, an old one, again, of the tunneling conductance between the layers. And I just got done telling you the tunneling was very weak. Well, it is very weak, but it's not so weak that we can't measure it. And it turns out to be a nice probe of the physics in this system. So we very carefully measure how much tunneling conductance there is. And I only, I'm only i not going to go into the details of this uh, until later, but basically the point is, is that if the layer separation between the two quantum wells is too large, the tunneling at low energies, meaning very little battery applied, is very, very small. The blue trace is strongly suppressed. In other words, you just don't see much tunneling between the two uh, quantum wells. On the other hand, as soon as, the red, as soon as you move that sample over to the position of the red dot, in other words, where now it has a quantum Hall effect, the tunneling explodes at, the, at, at zero energy and becomes very, very strong. This is one of the first really dramatic signatures uh, that we saw beyond just is there a Hall plateau or is there not. So, and I'm just giving a, a really crude survey right now to, to give you some flavor for the interesting physics that this system possesses. This, again, is tunneling data. The previous data that I showed you was the tunneling conductance, the differential conductance, di, dv. And what I'm showing here is a family of traces where I'm measuring the current versus the voltage. And there's many, many traces here. And the third axis is essentially one over the layer separation. And you can see that if I take samples with large layer separations, once again, there's no tunneling. It's very, very flat uh, down near zero energy. Obviously, if you put enough battery on, anything's going to carry current, so the tunneling turns on. But at low energies, nothing happens. But as the layer separation is reduced, eventually something dramatic occurs, and a, more or less a discontinuity appears in the tunneling IV characteristic. So for those of you that are familiar with superconductivity, uh, that's kind of uh, reminiscent of the DC Josephson effect that you might observe between, say, two aluminum films separated by an oxide layer. It looks like one, anyway, at the qualitative level. Another uh, remarkable uh, uh, property that you might, uh, uh, you might want to take a look at, and you won't understand why this is relevant for a few minutes, but you can look at, obviously, the Hall effect, like I showed you before, the quantum Hall effect, but you can do it in a peculiar way. These are two layers. I'm trying to indicate with these, these, these blue and yellow rectangles here. Those are the individual 2D layers. And what I'm going to do is find a way, it doesn't matter how I do it, to drive electrical currents in opposite directions in those two layers. So normally, you measure the Hall effect in a double-layer system. You just hook up a battery, and the current flows in the same direction in both layers. You can't even prevent it from doing that. Here, we have ways of making the current flow in opposition in the two layers, equal and opposite. Okay? And if we do that, we, and we measure the Hall effect in one of the two layers, either one, it doesn't matter which, we find out that when we go to the magnetic field where this special state exists, the so-called filling factor one configuration, the Hall effect vanishes. Now, that's a very strange thing. You're at a high magnetic field, you've got a very low density uh, system of carriers, and it has no Hall effect when you're measuring it in this particular configuration. If the currents were flowing again in the same direction, you would find a Hall plateau. Here you find a Hall plateau, but it's zero. Now, this is a very peculiar yeah. phenomenon. Jimmy, I yeah. Not very much. I mean, we've never spent a great deal of time on that. And the reason I say that is that we always ask Lauren Pfeiffer for the best sample that he can grow. And it's always the same mobility. It's always one million mobility. So we have a set of data that all looks like this. Like any quantum Hall state, if we change the amount of disorder, the width of the quantum Hall plateau will change in a characteristic way, the same way that it does uh, in a normal uh, single layer system. Eventually, it does. But you have to hit it pretty hard. Um, 
Maybe I say something about that at the end. So just, just, this is just phenomena right now. Don't worry about what it means. Okay, next, next, there it is. Uh, the red trace is RXX, measured meaning the longitudinal voltage uh, in one of the two. You find out it's zero two. So this is a very remarkable state of matter. I mean, it's high magnetic field. You're driving a current. There's no voltage transverse. There's no voltage longitudinal. It starts to smell like a funny state of matter. So what is that state of matter? Well, we have a pretty good, I would say a very good understanding at the qualitative level. It's not so hot at the quantitative level, with apologies to Steve. Uh, <laughs> he's doing his best. Um, but here, here's one picture that you can use to describe this physics. So you have these two uh, layers of electrons, one of which is blue and the other one's red, and they're both at the half filling point. If you bring them close together, they form a new state of matter. I've just shown you that they have, it has unusual transport characteristics, unusual tunneling, unusual Hall effect, etc. One way to think of that ground state of that system is as an exciton condensate. If you like, you can think of one of, the, one of the two electron, say one of the two layers, take the red one, and concentrate instead on the empty states in that Landau level, and call them holes, and imagine that what's really going on is that the electrons in the layer number one are binding onto the holes in layer number two. And in fact, this is exactly what we believe is going on. And you can write down a wave function, which I'm not going to go into any detail to describe, but basically it looks like the BCS state of an ordinary superconductor, with some differences, but the idea is very, very similar. The only really important distinction for this talk is to remember that these Cooper pairs in this, quote, superconductor are charge neutral. These are excitons, and so they're not the same as a charge 2E Cooper pair. Nonetheless, the structure of the wave function looks very similar, and in particular, there's a phase variable in here, a global phase variable, that plays much the same role that it plays in a superconductor or a superfluid. If there were gradients in that phase, it would correspond to some type of current flowing in the condensate. So this is something which is dis distinguishes this system from all other quantum Hall states, that, at least that I know about. Quantum Hall systems, the first thing you learn about the quantum Hall effect is that they have an energy gap, at least an energy gap to charged excitations. That's what gives rise to the quantum Hall plateau. In some sense, they're a lot like a semiconductor. There's an energy gap that you have. And in, in, indeed, if you make an excitation in the system, it'll have certain structure and shape that is different from one quantum Hall state to another, but nonetheless, all of them have this commonality that there's a gap to the charge, whatever the charged excitations are. They're fancy in this particular system. They're called merons and antimerons. They're very interesting. They have to do with topological singularities in that phase field that I mentioned a minute ago, but they're there. And this is the same as any quantum Hall effect, in essence. What's different about this one and separates it from all the other quantum Hall states is that there's another transport mechanism that is not present in an ordinary quantum Hall system. There's something that goes on in the condensate. In other words, it's a little bit like the difference between a semiconductor on the one hand and a superconductor. They both have energy gaps, but the superconductor has a condensate of Cooper pairs, and you can make supercurrents flow through that condensate and do nice things. This system also has a condensate. It's a condensate, a BCS-like condensate of excitons. Okay, so if we could make uh, excitons move through the system, say like this, from left to right, it would correspond from an electrical perspective to currents flowing in opposite directions in the two layers because one half of the exciton is negative, the other half is positive, so if it's moving in one direction, the currents must be in opposite directions. So this starts to make you think that what I showed you a minute ago, that the Hall resistance vanished, maybe that was not so surprising. If the condensate is carrying that current when they're flowing in opposite directions, well, there shouldn't be a Hall effect if the charge carriers are fundamentally neutral. Yes? Right. So I made a decision when I put up the view graph uh, showing you the particle hole transformation. I made a decision on which layer I was going to look at as holes and which layer I was going to look at as electrons. And as a consequence, I got, in this case, the electrons on the top and the holes on the bottom, and the things are going in that direction. I could have done the particle hole transformation the other way around, and then the excitons would have had to go the other way. But it doesn't matter. I can make either choice. That I, but once I make the choice, I need to stick with it, one way or the other. So the, question, the following question comes up. Have those experiments that I just, shown you, just showed you, especially that Hall effect, does that really prove that these excitons are there? It sounds good. No Hall effect. 
charge neutral objects carrying current in opposite directions. It sounds right. Is there a polarization? Say it again. Is there a polarization? There is and there isn't. I mean, if you just look here at these excitons, you would say, oh, my goodness, I've got this great big dipole moment. But don't forget, when you make a particle hole transformation, you, you, you're basically carrying around in your pocket a filled Landau level. So in fact, you've got charge that's in the background filling up one Landau level in one of these two layers, so that when you work out the total charge density, the answer is no. There is no charge. There is no dipole moment. So the question that I want to address, and this is what the recent experiments that we've been doing uh, do address, is have we really demonstrated that the, what these phenomena that I just showed you are due to exciton, trans, exciton transport or not. And one of the troubling, or not troubling, but one of the interesting aspects of quantum Hall systems is that they are topological insulators. And topological insulators, as you learned today, if you didn't already know it, have conducting states at their boundaries. And these, this is a particular a picture of a particular sample. All of the contacts that we make to this electron system were at the edge. So those conducting circuits, if you like, we're always there. You can ask, well, what role did they play in the measurements that I just showed you? And how could you possibly assert that a measurement made with contacts around the boundary proved that excitons were moving through the bulk? These are neutral objects. They're not confined to be in edge channels like the charged excitations would be. They, they're free to roam around. In principle, they should be able to roam around all through the sample, even though the bulk of the sample can't carry any charge. I should have said that before. Quantum Hall systems, I'll repeat myself, are topological insulators. They have conducting surface states, but they're insulating in their interior. They can't carry current in their interior for at low temperatures. This system is the same, but it has the possibility of conducting excitons through the interior, but they are neutral. So for the, in order to try to address this question, we and uh, uh, other groups, in particular uh, Klaus von Kutzing's group in Stuttgart, have been looking at Corbino geometries. Corbino geometries are just geometries that are multiply connected instead of being simply connected. In our case, they're basically donuts. This ring is basically, it's a, it happens to be a gate electrode, but it's on top of a two-dimensional electron gas, which is in the shape of a ring. There's a hole in the center, and there's a boundary at the outside. There are contacts to the outside rim, and there are contacts to the inside rim. So the interior of the sample, again, is insulating, but the exterior boundaries have these types of edge channels moving around. So I'll, uh, it's the title of the next view graph. I'll say what I've already said. Quantum Hall systems are topological insulators. If you make this measurement on a quantum Hall system, putting contacts on opposite edges, you should measure zero because you're trying to get current to cross the bulk, and the bulk is an insulator. Well, we've done measurements like this. People do them all the time. Um, and you find that when you're in, this is a single layer system, by the way. This is no longer a double layer. Whenever you're in a quantum Hall state, the conductance between the two black contacts falls to zero. It's an insulator, just like I said it would be. Same in this one. This is an integer quantum Hall state. This is a fractional quantum Hall state. doesn't matter. They're insulators. Okay? So we're going to try to do those type of experiments, but on a double layer system. So... Let me, uh, many of the pictures I'm about to show will show you this cartoon of what the circuit looks like. These are supposed to be a cross section through a donut structure where the contacts on the left are on one rim and the contacts on the right are on the opposite rim. There is no edge channel connecting this contact and that contact, and that's a crucial point. So if we see funny transport characteristics, it can only be due to things going through the bulk. And this was an important, this is important. If we make this measurement, uh, if we use that device, and we try to drive current by wiring it up like this from left to right, actually drive electrical current from left to right, we find that in, this is now for the bilayer case, at filling factor one, there are very, very little current flows. You notice, by the way, it's not as zero as some of these others. That's because this state is not as strong as some of the others. But it's getting very small at low temperatures. It's a perfectly good quantum Hall state. There is some residual conductivity, and I'll come back to that. All right, so let's do some experiments. This is the first experiment. Remember what the, remember what the cartoon means. I've got the battery connected to the outside edge of the system, one on top layer and one on the bottom layer. I'd be happy to talk to any of you who are interested in how the heck we do that, make them uh, on opposite layers. They're only separated by 300 angstroms. 
Uh, so it's, there's a trick involved in that. And we try to drive current. Well, this should look like a tunneling experiment. I've got two conductors, and I've got a battery between them. And I got done telling you a little while ago that there was this crazy phenomenon that looked like the Josephson effect in tunneling, and somehow it's not here anymore. And I got rid of it on purpose. I destroyed it on purpose. And I'll tell you why in a second. So here is the same sample showing you the same tunneling data, very little current flowing. And the reason it's so small is I intentionally tilted the magnetic field relative to the perpendicular of the sample. Why did I do that? I did, I, and by the way, I kept the perpendicular component fixed because that determines the filling factor. You're not allowed to change that. So we added some parallel component, and that took the tunneling from this picture to that one. It destroyed this zero energy, this low, uh, low voltage anomaly in the tunneling. This effect is actually rather similar to what you have in a Josephson device when you apply a parallel magnetic field. You, those of you that have done such a thing, you've heard of the Fraunhofer pattern. When you put mag magnetic flux in the plane between the two uh, uh, superconductors, it winds up the phase, and the, av the, the net tunneling current goes down in a nice, beautiful pattern. We've never seen that beautiful pattern for reasons that we don't really fully understand. But if we make enough magnetic field, the phase is winding so fast that the currents are up and down all over the place. They just average out to basically zero. We did this on purpose because the tunneling could obscure the measurements I'm about to show you. Yes? I'm sorry. Say it again. They're the same. It's the, it's the same. It's just, I mean, I, I haven't actually done that exact, I mean, a fair comparison of those because this is a different geometry with a different total surface area, right. et cetera, et cetera. But the phenomenologically, they're identical. Mm -hmm. This, I, I'm going to have a lot more to say about tunneling if I get to it. And if I don't, I'll, I'll tell you about it sometime in our coffee break or whatever. So let's back up. No, back up, Jim. Look at this data. Basically, you're supposed to look at that blue line and say that it's zero. <laughs> It's not exactly zero, but it's small. Maybe I've just fudged the axes so that it looks like it's zero, but I haven't. OK, and then I showed you this picture. Now I'm going to do one modification to this. I'm going to add a short circuit over here. I'm going to connect these two together with a wire. Now we know that the interior, I've already proven to you, the interior is insulating. So I'm going to this remote boundary, and I'm shorting it together. Normally, you would say, well, that can have no make no difference. If I have a circuit over here connected to a glass rod and another circuit over there at the other end of the glass rod, it won't matter what I do at the other end. Here, it's going to matter. Here's what happens. Again, this is the blue trace, which was the experiment without the short circuit, and then I make the short circuit. And now, all kinds of current is flowing. It's got a nonlinearity into it, in it, which we could talk about if you're interested, but a bunch of current's flowing on the scale of the blue curve. Not a big anomaly, not the tunneling effect at zero bias, but there's some big, more or less ohmic resistance here. A lot of current is flowing. Now, this is strange, because what I've shown you now are two experiments. I showed you this one first, and we proved that the sample was an insulator. And the things are connected in such a way that the currents are flowing in parallel. And then I just, all I've done is to alter the circuit to look like this. And now, lots of current flows. So for any two ordinary conductors, these two things would be in conflict with one another. They couldn't both be true. But they're both true here. It's insulating on the top, and it's conducting on the bottom. So how can this be? One possibility, this is the kind of thing we worry about in the lab all the time, is maybe somehow, in spite of the fact that we tilted the magnetic field and tried to suppress the tunneling, that we hooked up this short circuit and it turned back on by some hook or crook that we didn't fully understand. Well, that's a possibility, something one needs to think about. Another possibility is maybe the current is flowing in counterflow, like I would like you to believe. Uh, left to right in the top layer, right to left in the bottom layer. Maybe that's what's happening. How do we distinguish these two possibilities? Well, it's easy. You measure the current over here. You just put a device in there that tells you how much current is flowing through the short circuit, and if there's a lot of current there, then you know somehow it had to do this and not that 
not that crazy tunneling scenario that I just gave you. So we did that, easy to do. And we find out that the current that the battery is supplying, which is the blue trace, and the current that's flowing through the shunt, they're just equal. They don't look exactly equal here because they're measured with different amplifiers that have slightly different gains, but they're equal. Certainly, they're really close to being equal. So it must be true that it's like this. It must be that. Yes? So why is there an asymmetry in the, uh, in the current or the plus voltage and the minus voltage? I mean the fact that this is pushed off a little bit over here? Yeah. It's hard to determine where zero is, believe it or not. There are, these are small voltages, you notice. This is 200 microvolts. And these are DC measurements. And there are all, in our experience, there are always thermoelectric voltages in our circuit that end up causing displacements of this kind that we have to actually cancel out. Maybe 10, 20, 30 microvolts. These are inevitable. And is that the, the, and I also say there's a kink? Yeah. Uh, is that the critical current of the superfluid that you have? This here? Uh, no, there's a, there's a kink in the slope. Right there. Right there and also on the left. OK, right. The answer is no. Uh, we believe that this is, in fact, a completely spurious effect having to do with series resistances that are in parts of the circuit that, you're not, that I have not shown. In other words, the circuit looks like this. But for goodness sake, it's not really exactly this simple. There are regions of two-dimensional electron gas out here that are not in the correlated nu equal one state. Those can have nonlinear conductances and do. So this is a completely spurious effect. Not spurious. It's, it's, it's a nuisance effect. You think it's completely ohmic? This nonlinearity is not real? As far as we can tell, it's completely ohmic. As far as we can tell. I mean, we should do more on this. So... Now, be careful, because you might have been lulled into a sense of, this is stupid, you know? I mean, I can understand this. Of course, the currents are going in opposite directions. Anybody would guess that. It's stranger than you think. So think hard about it. Let's, admit, let's go back, and I'm telling you that current flows when this circuit is set up. So your inclination is to say, of course it flows. So why not do this? Oops, yeah. Let's add a little wire. Let's short circuit the bottom layer. Two-dimensional electron gases are quite resistive. I mean, the resistances are 100 kilo ohms. I can add a short circuit that's one ohm. And sure enough, if these two things were just independent conductors, the current would all flow through the short circuit. And in fact, if you take the system and put it at a magnetic field where this state does not exist, of course, all the current flows through the short circuit. No current flows through the short circuit when we're in this state. You measure no current here. It all goes back through here. In other words, the only way this will work is if you think of both layers as being a single system carrying, uh, with the possibility of carrying anti-parallel currents in a special way. You cannot think of the system as being two uh, independent layers. So isn't it the wire, the wire has a, a conductance that's larger than the one you showed us in the... Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Yes, you can just short it to ground. Doesn't do it. Does not go out there. Maybe I missed you. I'm worried that I'm not understanding your question well enough, but. OK. Good. That's more than I did. If you go into non excitonic state by larger, how will the curve look like? OK, let me, let me hold you off on that for a moment. And I'll show you, because I've got, I don't have data to show that. But I have data to show it in an analogous circumstance, which I think will satisfy you. So let's now switch gears and try a different experiment that's closely related. So in my lab for the last many years, I don't want to say how many, long time, we've been doing this experiment. This is really fun. You have two conductors. It doesn't matter what they are. They could be aluminum foil separated by mylar. And you put a current through the yellow one, and you ask, does a voltage appear in the blue one? This is a straightforward question. Well, normally, you would, if you try it with tinfoil and mylar, I guarantee you, you won't. If you, if you do see something, let me know. I don't think you'll see anything. Very, very tiny effect. But of course, electrons you know, scatter off of one another by Coulomb interactions. And some of that Coulomb interaction extends from the one layer to the other layer. And so there's actually a drag process whereby the Coulomb interaction pushes the electrons along in both layers, and a voltage really does appear here, and it's called Coulomb drag. It's a lot of fun. You learn, you learn interesting things. But what I want to do now is I want to do that for the first time in Corbino geometry. So it's, oops, didn't switch. I went the wrong way. That way. 
I want to do this experiment. There are my two layers. I apologize. Now I've got I, my artistic abilities went up, and I'm now using uh, donuts instead of straight lines. But you get the idea. The current, I'm trying to drive a current through what I would call the, the green layer or the drive layer. And the way the battery is set up, it's supposed to go from outside to inside, right, like that. And I want to see, and then I'm taking the outer layer, and I'm short-circuiting it to itself with some resistor. And I want to know, will any current flow in this resistor? Well, the first thing you might say is, this is a stupid experiment, because you just told me the system was an insulator, so how can you drive the current anyway? Well, but it's a very special insulator. It's an insulator that has these excitons in it that can carry currents in opposite directions. Though it's not so obvious. So now let's answer your question. What happens if you're outside the phase? If you go outside the phase, well, in fact, just, you just raise the layer separation uh, so it's not small enough to support this phase. You have your composite fermion system. That's a conductor not, that does ha not have a gap. You find out that current will flow in the drive layer in a perfectly ohmic fashion. No big deal. But you don't pick up any current in the drag layer. Maybe there is some, but it's really, really small. Okay, so nothing interesting here. However, if you now change the sample and take it into the situation where the two layers are in the excitonic state, you find out that at small, at least at small voltages, the two currents are equal. In other words, not only does current flow in the, in the unconnected layer, but it flows in exactly the same magnitude. doesn't matter what the resistors are either. The, I mean, the, the numerical value does, but the equality of I1 and I2 is preserved regardless of what the resistors are. So this is very interesting. What's going on? So here's what's going on. You've probably already realized this yourself. I've presented you two experiments, and they're very complementary. This was the first one. And I'm telling you that the reason current, the reason that current flowed was because excitons were traversing the otherwise insulating bulk. No charge was going by because there was always a positive associated with a negative. And I proved to you that you couldn't, you couldn't avoid that. If you tried to short circuit the current in one of the layers, you would fail. It only works because these excitons are there. This circuit sort of looks intuitively okay. This one is a little harder to swallow. There's no wiring connecting the two layers. And yet the current flows anyway. Okay, and it does so by the same process. Transport excitons from left to right. And since excitons are plus in one layer, minus in the other, of course the currents are equal. They have no choice but to be. Of course they're in opposite directions. And in the picture that I showed you, I showed you the magnitudes of the currents. And let me just assert that they were in opposite directions. Thank goodness for that. Yes? Go back one? Sure. Right. Where is it here? It's a smart audience. Um, so how did I get to this point? It turns out that that nonlinearity that I told you was due to external effects was most pronounced at the lowest electron densities. To reach this configuration, I've changed the electron density so that the effective, I didn't even talk about this, so that the effective layer separation was large enough to destroy the excitonic state. By doing so, I had to greatly increase the electron density. That made the nonlinearity go away. Believe me, this nonlinearity is its probably interesting at some level, but it's not really relevant to this talk. But good question and good, good observation. So you notice also that in this picture, the two currents don't stay equal. They become unequal, and quite, quite, quite substantially so. Current always flows in the drag layer, as far as we know. We didn't, didn't go 10 times higher than this, but... Current's always out there in the drive layer, and that's already remarkable that any current at all is in the, drive, in, the dra in the drag layer. But why aren't they equal? Well, they're not equal. It's actually pretty simple. Let's see. Right. I've confused myself. Anyway, they're not equal, and what I want to now show is that in both of these experiments, they sh if, if this were the only mechanism... If it was only exciton transport that was responsible, the two currents should be equal in both cases because it's just exciton transport. And yet they're not equal. 
So what's going on? So here's the ratio of the two currents, I2 divided by I1. At the lowest temperature, 17 millikelvin, and the lowest drive voltages, the ratio comes very close, but not exactly. It's about 0.97. Very, very close to one, but it's not exactly one. And then as we raise the temperature, it becomes substantially smaller and eventually basically goes away. If I, instead of simply raising the temperature, I raise the amount of battery voltage applied, as you could tell from that graph, the ratio declines also. So something's destroying this simple exciton transport. And it's very easy to understand what it is. So let's take a look at this. Here's the geometry again. And if you think about this, if you assume that the exciton transport itself is superfluid, perfectly conducting, then your immediate, and, and, and the charge transport, sigma xx, is completely insulating, then you're led to the following conclusion for these two currents. I1 and I2, A, should be equal, and B are given by the voltage of the battery divided by the sum of the external resistors. Five minutes? Okay. By the sum of the external resistors. Has nothing to do with anything inside the excitonic system. It's only the external resistors. That's true of both experiments. However, if the conductivity of the electron gas is not absolutely zero, and I remember I showed you it wasn't completely zero, then there's some conductivity for charge. If you analyze this experiment again, and just go through some simple arithmetic, but continue to assume that the, super, the excitons are superfluid, those equations are slightly modified. I1 and I2 are no longer precisely equal. They're given by a ratio of 1 divided by this particular quantity. And if sigma xx for the charge transport is 0, then this is unity. But otherwise, it's not. So in other words, what's happening here is that the, when you turn up the temperature, some charged objects appear. They can conduct because you haven't, they're not completely frozen out. If you turn on the bias large enough, any quantum Hall effect will break down and charge will go through. Any insulator that you know about, you put a big enough battery on it, it'll eventually conduct. That process of parasitic conduction is being added to the exciton transport. And if you add those two things together, you can very nicely explain. And I won't show you this data. I'll just show you this. We took this, again, that same data that I showed you a moment ago. And we measured the conductivity sigma xx for the charged conduct, the charge carriers and used it to, through that extended model, used it to predict the ratio of the drag and we get these values. Furthermore, we can also uh, look at the nonlinearity and predict the way the two curves should separate. So in the end of the day, the uh, uh, reason that they're separating is because charge transport is beginning to take over. Rhetoric. You mean when I put that extra wire in? Because we were at low, there, there, you weren't adding a sigma xx channel. You were, if, let's suppose some current had flowed through that wire. Suppose that 50% of it decided to go through the wire. The only way that could have happened would have been for the currents in the two layers to no longer be equal and opposite. So that would have meant that a net charge was transported through the 2D electron gas. But the conductivity for charge was zero. So it could not have happened. If we put on large enough voltage, it would, it would begin. It would begin for the same reason as here. I've got to finish up, so let's see. I'm sorry. Yes, exactly. It's a, I showed the picture of those very, very quickly at, uh, early on, that um, these excitations in this system, as in all quantum Hall systems, are vortex-like objects. In this case, they are vortex vortices in this phase field. They happen to have charge E over 2. They can combine in pairs or not, but they're charge carriers. And they have an interesting internal structure, which I'm not really commenting on. OK. So this is what we've learned. So excitons can transport energy. This resistor gets hot. But there's no charge transport across the bulk. The question then is, and that's a silly cartoon, 
um, which I would like to get rid of, does V equal IR? And what that really is, is it asking, is the amount of heat generated in this resistor precisely equal to the amount of energy being supplied by the battery? If it is, then there's no additional energy being lost in the transport of the excitons. And that's a really important question, because I've asserted to you that at some level, this is a superfluid. And these things ought to not carry out and ought to not dissipate any energy, at least at small currents. So how, you know, how what good of a job have we been able to do to determine that? And the answer is not a very good job. We've tried hard, and we've made a model, and our conclusion is that if there is, if there is a resistance associated with the exciton transport itself, in other words, something because it's not really superfluid, those equations for the two currents, well, they're still equal. There's no, as long as there's no parallel, you know, parallel conductivity, as I've just indicated. But there'll be additional resistance in the denominator. It will suppress the amount of current that flows. There's a bunch of resistance. It'll make the current go down. So how, how well can we tell that this is zero? It's hard, because these numbers are big in our experiment. They're maybe 100 kilo ohms each. Makes it hard to know that this is, say, one ohm. We haven't been able to tell that. But we know that it's very small in comparison with these 100 kilo ohms. And other measurements have indicated to us that it's below our ability to see. And I don't, wanna, I don't have time to describe this, um, so I won't. Uh, it's an effort to try to say, to what extent can we tell you that the exciton dissipation is zero? And we have indication that it's small, but this, there's quotation marks on the word small. All right. Do I have any time left? One minute. Perfect. Five more view graphs. That's great. So let me quickly return to this picture. So let's go fast now, in case you haven't been going fast. This is the tunneling again. It looks like the Josephson effect. And, you know, Steve and I, uh, years ago, used to talk about how sharp this was. It's much sharper nowadays than it was then. It's well below a microvolt in width. We don't know how narrow it really is. This is a four-terminal measurement. And it looks an awful lot like a Josephson effect. And the question is, is it really a Josephson effect? Do these equations have any real, these were Josephson equations, do they have any relevance to this experiment or not? One thing we can measure is this thing called the critical current. We can imagine that what's going on is that the phase variable is time independent in the supercurrent branch, just as it would be in a normal Josephson's injunction, and then goes into a time varying state where you get a voltage out here. Is this really a critical current? Well, we've tried measuring that in various ways. And we find out some interesting things. I'll skip this picture and go to this one. The first thing we found out is it doesn't matter what context you measure it with. You can measure it with these two on 180 degrees opposite, but on the two different layers. Or you can measure it with these two, which are close together on the perimeter. Or you can measure it on the interior one. They're all the same. The critical current appears to be a universal parameter of this sample. This suggests that the tunneling is occurring everywhere in the device and uniformly. We can also do another really cute experiment. And this was first done by the Stuttgart group. Um, actually, it wasn't first done by them, but they were the first ones to publish it. So they get the credit. What these, what these curves are is these are the maximum currents in the both plus and minus direction that we can drive with a battery over here, excuse me, um, yeah, over here on the left-hand side of the sample, on the outer rim, while we put a steady amount of current in on the other rim. If that steady current is zero, we get 1.5 nanoamps positive, 1.5 nanoamps negative. But now, if I add some current over here, a fixed amount, in this case, one nanoamp, it simply changes the two maxima and minima measured on the other side by that one nanoamp. So that what you're really finding is it's the total current that goes in that is a critical current. Not the amount stuck in at one edge or the amount stuck in at the other edge. It's the sum total of the two. And these two curves go along and they're parallel to one another, which tells me very clearly that this tunneling is occurring uniformly. This is a surprise, which I think even Steve will believe it's a surprise. If you think about the way the phase variable varies in this system, and this is going to be my last view graph, really, um, there's some josephson light tunneling term. There's some supercurrent coming from a gradient in the phase. You put these two things together, basically you conserve current, and you end up with a sine gordon equation that contains something known as the Josephson penetration length. 
That has to do with the stiffness of, this, of the phase variable and the amount of tunneling. It's a number we can compute. We don't know it accurately, but we can compute it with some approximation. And it always comes out to be micron-sized. If that were the case, the tunneling at the outside edge would die off very rapidly as I go into the bulk. And it would turn on again if I had a short circuit. I mean, if I had another similar circuit, identical in this case, on the other edge, it would turn on over there. If that were the case, the two edges just wouldn't talk. And if I put a nanoamp in over here, I would still get the same plus or minus one and a half nanoamps on the other edge. There would be, they wouldn't know that the other one existed. The only way to get them to know it is if somehow this Josephson length is much longer than the sample size. And the sample size is 200 microns. That's way outside the uncertainty in these parameters. So we don't really know what's going on here, but there's a good idea out there from Nigel Cooper and his students and postdocs that this is a disorder effect, that there's some kind of coarse graining going on that in the end of the day means that this effective Josephson penetration length is very, very long. We're going to see, uh, do more experiments to try to find out if that's the proper interpretation or not. Okay, I put this up and then I'd better shut up because I know I ran over time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, so Jim, the other question that I was asking, I do not know. I, actually, I don't think it can be experimentally verified. What happens is that if you have ordinary momentum scattering, that would not do much because this is like a BCS superfluid. Are you asking about the, you bring up the disorder Disor issue again? Yeah. So, you know, ordinary momentum scattering doesn't do much because it's like a BCS superfluid. I'm, I'm actually ignoring the quantum hall part of it. I do not know what quantum hall does. Let's just leave quantum hall out of it. So it's an excitonic superfluid. It's a BCS theory, as you know. And ordinary momentum scattering would not do much. Same reason it doesn't do anything in, you know, so-called Anderson's theorem. But if you have any chemical potential fluctuation, which you know charge impurities produce, that is like having a magnetic field fluctuation in, in, in um, uh, ordinary BCS superconductor. That will destroy the superfluidity right away. All you need is yeah. the chemical potential fluctuation. So, I, need, so I, 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 I should say that there's many things I didn't talk about. Right. One of which is that in the ideal disorder-free theory of this business, right. you know there's a costrelitz thalus sure. temperature. And below that, which, by the way, should be of order half a Kelvin, it's some huge temperature on our scale. Yeah. Uh, we go way below that. Um, it should be the case, if that's true, that the superfluidity just turns on with a, you know, a characteristic jump and an exponent it and all this fancy stuff. Way. Never observed any okay. of that stuff. So there, there and the reason understand. we don't observe it for sure is disorder. Yeah, okay. How it's, you know, microscopically, how it's breaking up vortex pairs, I think maybe doesn't, isn't known so well. But it's there. Have some experimental evidence that these already do something. No question about it. No question theory. about it. Same thing's true with the tunneling in a magnetic field. This disorder is quite important. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to see something similar in any topological um, So uh, you're asking the wrong person this, but I know that uh, there certainly are proposals um, to take topological insulators and make thin films of them. And if, you know, make them thin enough, if the t surface state on the top hybridizes with the surface state on the bottom and does something similar, then this kind of physics may come out of it. So the answer, I think, is yes. Uh, but I'm not the, not the person to give you any detailed answer to that question. <laughs> My you. question is related to the questions you put up there. Is it possible to do some kind of a persistent current measurement in these systems? I've been thinking about that for 20 years. And I have, and I don't know the answer still. I'm a slow thinker. Um, I don't know the answer to it, but let me put it this way. If, let's suppose that it was there in this donut. How would I detect it? The currents are flowing in opposite directions, so there's no magnetic moment. Right? There's no angular momentum, I don't think. So the conventional ways that you detect superfluid, um, you know, superfluid flow, say, in helium going around it, in an annulus with angular momentum, that's out. You can't detect it magnetically from the magnetization, that's out. Maybe there's some other way. Maybe there's a tiny quadrupole moment, but boy, I bet it's really tiny. Um, I don't know how I detect it. And, I don't, and then on top of that, I don't even know how to make it in the first place, how to, how to really launch it. Getting away from one another, yeah. 
in terms of uh, parallel conductance t being turned on. Uh, that probably takes place together with the, the counterflow conductance going down, right? The two things. Uh, it's plausible that that's happening. We the don't. The model has only we, one. The model does not. You don't. You you can make a perfectly sensible model that completely assumes everywhere from the beginning that the that the supercurrent is super, and that the only thing that's happening is that sigma xx is going nonlinear. And you can measure the, I didn't show you the data, I, I, I flashed through it. You can measure that nonlinear. So the fitting is not, like, fictitious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's semi-quantitative, and it can basically fit the whole thing. So I don't think that's a good way to look for superfluid dissipation. I think there are better ways. Um, so you're right. In principle, that could be part of it. So can you measure the counterflow conductance as a function of temperature by this uh, um, counterflow... Uh, measurement by measuring the the, uh, anti the the asymmetric voltage. How does it depend on temperature? And no, you can't do that because I mean, in the, at least not with these measurements. Whenever we raise the temperature in any of the counterflow measurements, mm -hmm. the parallel conduct the the charge conductivity turns yeah. on and comes in and does its thing. But you impose that the currents are opposite to one another. In the case, okay, you're, you're correct. In in the case, in one experiment, in the one where you make the short circuit, mm -hmm. yeah, then you, you're guaranteed that it's counterflow. And I'd have to go back and look at my notes, what happens as a function of temperature. I don't remember. I would have to look. Uh, sir, uh, what was uh, between the two layers? I mean, uh, was the vacuum or something insulated? Right. So I, you know, in the interest of time, I didn't tell you anything about the experimental details. So these are two... Gallium arsenide quantum wells, which are each uh, 18 nanometers thick, and they're separated by a 10 nanometer layer of almost pure aluminum arsenide. Uh, did you try different uh, insulator uh, between the layers, or did you try vacuum, or it is yeah, so vacuum is kind of tough. Independent of the <laughs> <laughs> vacuum's hard because uh, you know the you know, understand why it'd be hard. Um, the only thing in, within the gallium arsenide aluminum gallium arsenide system which is the one you want to use because that's where everybody knows how to do crystal growth properly to get the requisite high mobility. You can change the height and the width of that barrier, and that we do routinely. If we make the barrier width a lot smaller, you know what that does is it makes the tunneling go crazy. The reason we have the almost pure aluminum arsenide is that makes the tall barrier, which simultaneously and thin, so that the Coulomb interactions are important. So we have a, we're in a narrow corner of phase space in terms of growth. And if we walk this way or we walk this way, it always hurts. So vacuum is, for this system is out of, no, out of I the mean, question. I uh, mean, this phenomenon is independent of the uh, uh, property between, um, I mean, separation between the layer. I mean, I mean at the, at the at qualitatively, yes, it's completely independent of it. But, you know, we've got a dielectric constant of 12 or something in that layer. So that certainly matters at the quantitative level. There are people right now trying to reproduce this kind of physics in double-layer graphene. Not bilayer graphene, but graphene and then, say, uh, whatever that stuff is, uh, boron nitride, and then another graphene on top of it. This kind of physics should show up there. I, I believe somebody will find that, maybe even at zero magnetic field. Possible. Not yet, though. Next speaker is Professor Danshu Mandal from 